All right, you can turn in your Bible to the book of Matthew, chapter 16. Um, doing a lot of construction work this, this year, a lot of different projects going, and um, you know, I'm going to be trying to get as many videos as done as I can, but there's a lot of work to do, um, non-ministry related work. And I was listening to some of my older sermons and things, and um, I'm have done quite a few sermons over the years on church buildings. What is what does the word church mean? Things like that. And uh, I I noticed that in almost every single one I've done, I, I'll make this statement. I'll say, you know, you can go through the Bible and look up every time the word church appears. Uh, you'll see that, you know, it's never a reference to a building and things. And, you know, sometimes I like to do a study on that kind of a deal. Well, I've never done that till now. Uh, that's what we're going to do today. This is going to be a different type of a study. Sometimes there's um, a study, an expository study. Expository, if you're a new Christian, it just simply means you take Matthew chapter 16 and you go verse by verse by verse by verse. You compare the different scriptures to other verses in the Bible, comparing spiritual things with things spiritual, as the Bible tells us to do. Um, that's expository preaching. There's subject preaching where you say, uh, what happens if somebody takes the mark of the beast? Okay, I did a sermon on that. And you'll have, you know, go through the scriptures talking about that particular subject. That's probably one of the main types that I've done. But there's another type of study that I've done a few times, not very often, and this is going to be another one of those times, and that is a word study. In other words, you take a concordance. I have here a Strong's concordance. I don't mess with the Greek or the Hebrew in the back. Why should I? I already have it translated into English for me by 54 of the most brilliant men that ever lived back in 1604 to 1611. So why on earth would I mess with it? And um, I'm not going to do a better job translating than they did. But we're going to look at the word church today and then follow that with the word churches. Right? We're going to go through every single reference in the King James Bible. And I'm going to prove to you that the word church is always a reference to people, never once to a building. Okay? Uh, no opinions, no, uh, you know, feelings or whatever else. We're going to look at the scriptures today. All right? And it starts out very interesting. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Let's read here. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, the Catholics are doing backflips and cartwheels and foaming at the mouth and everything, saying, we have the right religion. It's where the Catholics, the Catholic Church, it's where we were founded, right there. Uh, well, just a problem there. Problem number one. Look at verse 18 there. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, you know, thou art Peter, comma, and upon this rock I will build my church. So they'll say, the Catholics say, the rock is Peter. Peter was the first pope. Look down at verse 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Now if the church was founded on Peter, right then at that point in verse 18, then the Lord just called it Satan, Satan's church there, if you want to be technical about it. He just called Peter Satan. He didn't say, hey, look out, Peter, you know, Satan's deceiving you. He said, get thee behind me, Satan, to Peter. That would mean that the first pope was Satan at that point in time. Jesus called him Satan. And, of course, later on, Peter gets saved, you know, after Jesus dies on the cross. There's a blood atonement there then that, to pay for his sins. But the whole point is, it's, it's interesting how the Catholics will read verse 18, but they'll leave out verse 23 in their theology. How very interesting. But it gets worse. Keep your hand there in Matthew 16. We'll be coming back there eventually, but I want you to go over to 1 Corinthians, the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 3. Verse 9, another very interesting tie-in here to the uh, thing of the church being the people, not buildings. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. The saved people are the building. 
But check this out, verse 10, verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Peter and the Catholic Church. Uh, no, actually it didn't say that. It says, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation upon which the church is built. Not Peter. The rock that Jesus is referring to back here in Matthew 16, verse 18, that rock is a reference to Jesus Christ. I mean, look at what it says there in verse 18, here in Matthew 16. I will build upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But the gates of hell did prevail just a few minutes later when Jesus had to rebuke Peter and call him Satan. But it gets worse. You say, well, that was before Peter's conversion. That's before he became the first pope officially, you know, after Jesus rose from the dead. Then he crowned Peter. And uh, right around the time that Mary was called up, uh, the assumption of Mary back up to heaven, it was right around that time that, that they formed the first Catholic church and things. Never mind the fact that Peter was married. He wasn't a celibate pope. We'll just leave that out too. You know, we'll just say, well, that came later on. That came as the church fathers got holier. They stopped marrying, even though the Bible says to marry. But uh, never mind that. Uh, forbidding to marry, which is a doctrine of devils. Uh, we'll leave that out too. But there's another problem. You say, well, see, Peter here, this is before he got saved, so that's why Jesus rebuked him, called him Satan. But after he got saved, he was the first infallible pope. Let's look about that. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. The Apostle Paul here, it says, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Why didn't Peter go submit himself to the Pope? Pope Peter the first? Why didn't he go? You say, well, look at the other verse. We're getting there. We're getting there. Verse 17. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. That's when he went up to the Pope, right? Why did it take him three years? I mean, he's an apostle. Shouldn't he have gone and gotten his official commission from the Pope there, Pope Peter I? But there's a bigger problem. Let's look at chapter 2 here in Galatians. Chapter 2, verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before there certain that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. I thought the gates of hell wouldn't prevent prevail against the Pope Peter. Verse 13, And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now, Paul was completely out of line rebuking Pope Peter I in front of all the other archbishops and cardinals. No. <laughs> um, they were men of equal authority. Peter was not the first pope. He was not the rock that the church was founded upon. He was teaching false doctrine after his conversion. So if Jesus is setting up his holy Catholic church here in Matthew 16, 18, with Peter as the first infallible pope, then you have a real problem because years and years later, he's sinning by teaching false doctrine. Peter was not the first pope. Okay? Let's go back to Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Uh, if you're a Catholic, you need to repent of uh, your wickedness, your sin. 
You need to come to the Lord as a sinner. Uh, membership in a church, your Catholic church, is going to guarantee you a place in the fires of hell and then into the lake of fire into eternity. All right? You need to get out of that thing. Catholicism, there are no saved Catholics. Okay? Don't believe some of the uh, little Laodicean brethren out there that will tell you, uh, well, I do believe there are some saved Catholics. They're just in for family reasons and whatever else. I don't care who says it. They're wrong. There are no saved Catholics. If you get saved and you're a Roman Catholic, the Lord's going to get you out of that system. And if you rebel, He's going to whip you until you're out of that system. Just as simple as that. But let's go on to the next one now. Matthew chapter 18, verse 17, the second time that the word church appears. And I'm just going to read the verse. I'm not going to read up and down, you know, very much. I'm just going to go right to the verse and read it. Matthew chapter 17, right? Matthew chapter 18, excuse me, verse 17. It says here, And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. So here what you're doing is you walk up to the building, First Baptist Church or whatever your Baptist church is, Presbyterian, Methodist, whichever one you want to pick, and you speak to the building, right? No. Um, it's When you're telling it under the church, if you neglect to hear the church, it's a group of people. And ironically, it's actually before the crucifixion. Hmm. And we're going to see later on that there's actually a reference to the church in the wilderness being back in the Old Testament. You see, church, if you want to get into the Greek word there, it's ekklesia. It means a called out assembly. Now, you don't need to know all that stuff. That's, that's not, you know, old one. We, we should change it from church to called out assembly. No, we should stay with the word that the Lord cho chose there. All right, that's important. And we're going to see about that later on, too. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But that's the last reference there. And doctrinally, both of those statements were made in the Old Testament before Jesus died on the cross. Again, read Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 through 17. You'll see that the Testament came in. It was a force after the death of the testator. Jesus died on the cross. So this is doctrinally in the Old Testament. References to the church. Hmm. Interesting. But next, let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 47. And I realize there's going to be some people that this is going to be dull for them because it's just going from verse to verse to verse. A lot of scripture, but you know. Sorry for you if you don't have that good of an attention span. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. It says here, well, we'll, well, just verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Yeah, uh, you mean the building? The Lord's adding to the church. He's putting some boards on it and some nice stained glass windows and things like that. He's talking about people. But let's look up a verse or two here. Uh, well, let's just go up to verse 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house that eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And then it goes on to say about the Lord adding to the church daily. You say, well, wait a second. Verse 46 says temple. We got you. I've had people use this, you know. They met in the temple early on. Yes, they met in the Jewish temple because early on it was the Jews. All right, They were going to the Jewish people here in the book of Acts chapter 2. That's why you don't use Acts chapter 2 verse uh, 38 as the plan of salvation. It's not our plan of salvation. Paul, the gospel is revealed to Paul. All right? The book of Acts is a transition book. That's very important to understand. And you go along and you say, I was, I was baptized in the name of, the, of Jesus Christ. Well, okay, but did you repent of your sin? Did you come to the Lord in faith? Do you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? You know, well, I, I got baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, sorry, that doesn't cut it. Yeah, but Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 is not the gospel of salvation right now. The gospel by which we are saved is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Read it. Look it up. You got to compare spiritual things with things spiritual. Rightly divide the word of truth. Very, very important. Again, watch some of my other studies. You know, because I'll, I'll get this in the comments sometimes. I will look at the comments. And I see people, they'll say, but I don't understand this and I don't understand that. Well, watch the other sermons that I've done and I took the time to explain it in those other studies. 
Uh, when you approach the Bible, it, it's going to take some study. It's going to take some research. Uh, you don't just come to this book and just say, well, you know, give it to me in five minutes or less. It doesn't work that way. But let's continue. Acts chapter 5, verse 11. Maybe this one will have a building in it. Don't think so. Acts chapter 5, verse 11. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Uh, what's it look like when a building gets scared? Well, kind of like in an earthquake. I guess maybe it shakes a little bit. But a little joke there. Um, buildings don't get scared. The fear came upon the people. The people are the church. Acts chapter 7, verse 38. Acts 7, 38. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Okay? Talking about Moses. The verse right before talks about Moses there. That was in the church in the wilderness. Isn't that interesting? And there's quite an interesting picture there. Why? Well, what was the church in the wilderness in the Old Testament? The Jewish people. Where did they come out, come out of? They came out of Egypt. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? The Jewish people were prisoners there. They were in captivity. They were in bonds in the land of Egypt. And the Lord brought them out of there. They are a called out assembly. They were a church. How about that? And, you know, I will stick to the term church age for our current dispensational time that we are in here. This time between the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the rapture. Uh, okay, I'll stick with the word church age, but you see there's a problem with that. Uh, you know, it's kind of, there's many things that we've adopted over the years, you know, that we just say and people, you know, know what we mean, but they're not really scriptural. And to call this time period the church age being that everything written for the church is all for us, well, not really. Because the church is just a called out assembly. And so, technically, you can't really call it the church age, but people have, most people know what we mean by that. So, you know, we don't have to get real technical on that, but interesting nonetheless. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. It says here, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So the building was scattered around there, right? No, it was the people. Again, uh, there's just no scripture for this thing of church buildings. Look at verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, Hmm. And hailing men and women committed them to prison. Isn't that interesting? Where was the church at? Where was you know this church? Where was it meeting? Into every house. Hmm. When you get a couple Christians together, you know the Lord spoke back in the Gospels about you know I can't think of the actual scripture reference right now, but it, He said about um, where two or three are gathered together and. In, in, um, or gathered, gathered together, there am I in the midst. All right? So, you know, when you have Christians coming together, the Lord's there. You don't have to be in some kind of a holy building and things like this where you revere the building and, oh, it's a holy, it's good to be in the house of God and all this other stuff. Nope, nope. You can meet in a house and you're still in church. And here's a real shocker for you. If you're saved, you're in church all the time. We're going to see that later. Get a hold of that one. Somebody says, why weren't you in church on Sunday? Uh, I'm always in church. You want to really uh, flip a, a lost person out? They say, uh, where do you go to church? You say, I'm in it right now. Huh? <laughs> you know, do that to somebody when you're outside or at a store someplace. They'll give you the weirdest look. They'll be like, what? Huh? <laughs> yeah. I'm in church all the time. The church is the body of Christ. Getting ahead of myself again. But let's continue. Acts chapter 11, verse 22. Acts 11, verse 22. 
Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church. Ears of the church? Isn't that, isn't that weird? Didn't know that buildings could have ears. Hmm. Ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. A building is called they, and they have ears. Hmm. Maybe it was a corn cob house or something like that, you know, made out of corn cobs, ears of corn. <laughs> but let's continue. Acts chapter, where are we at next? Ver, uh, 11 verse 26. Here's another very important verse. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Okay, the first time that they were called Christians was there in Antioch. This is the verse right here, Acts 11, 26. But again, they assembled themselves uh, with the church and taught much people. It's not the building, it's the people. And of course, you know, the, the little uh, people will go, yes, but you know, it's the, the, the we understand that the, the people are the church and not the building, but we still go to church, you know. It's just like they don't even understand. They can't even comprehend in their minds that they're continually, perpetually lying and proving themselves to be hypocrites. Yes, I understand that the church is the people, but we still go to church. You know, I still believe that we should be in church on Sunday. You know, God is not the author of confusion. God's not the author of these Babel buildings. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. Vexing the church. Hmm. Verse 2, I'm going to read down here because I'm going to kick something else. And he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So the building there was praying for Pope Peter I. Wow, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> no, it was the people. The people are the church. And Peter was not the first pope. All right? But here's the point. I don't actually have a video on this, and I should probably just make a video dedicated to this subject. What about this thing of Acts chapter 12, verse 4? There where you have Easter. And all these uh, new version perverts will come out and they'll say, uh, Easter is obviously a mistranslation because the Greek word Pascha should be translated as Passover. Uh, well, that presents quite a few problems. Number one, verse three says, Then were the days of unleavened bread. Uh, verse four, intending after Easter. Here's the problem. The days of unleavened bread come after the Passover. So Passover here, days of unleavened bread here. So if it's days of unleavened bread, and Herod says, okay, after the Passover, we'll put the correct word in according to what they say, then that means that Herod is saying, we're going to wait till next year. Because Passover was already before the Days of Unleavened Bread. It's the Days of Unleavened Bread now, and he says, we've got to wait till after Passover. You see what I'm saying? It makes a problem. All right. Uh, no, the word is Easter. Here's another little issue. Um, they'll say, well, the Greek word's Pascha. It should always be translated Passover. Again, this is another one of the little arguments that the new version people will come up with. We're going to see this later on, too, with the church's word. But they come up with this argument of uniform translation. A Greek word or a Hebrew word should always be translated the same way. Uh, no, that doesn't work. That's not proper translation. All right? No Bible translation practices uniform translation. Okay, That just doesn't happen. All right. But here's the interesting thing about this. Do you know what the... Greek word is, if you want to, the Greek word for Easter, the English word Easter, what is the Greek word? You know what it is? Pascha. So Pascha can either be Easter or Passover. In fact, I think it's the Luther, uh, Heidegger Schrift 
of Martin Luther, he translates every time Pascha shows up, instead of saying Passover for anything, he always says Easter, 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 Easter. Interesting. And uh, a lot of the Greek Orthodox churches will actually, instead of saying Passover or Easter, they'll say, or excuse me, instead of saying the word Easter for that holiday, they'll say Pascha. It's Pascha time, Pascha Sunday and things like this. See, the translation is determined by the context. When you approach a translation of Scripture, when you approach any kind of translation, really, even if you're trying to translate something from, if I want to translate uh, my notes here to German or something, or to Spanish or to Japanese or whatever, you have to look at the thing and you have to say, okay, what is the exact equivalent of this word from this language to this language? All right. Does the context support me using that exact translation? Or is it not going to make sense? Does the word order line up? I mean, there's so many things that go into translation. And the King James translators, they got to this point and they said, wait a second. The days of unleavened bread are in verse 3. It couldn't have been the Passover in verse 4. And there's another point too. Was Herod a Jew or a pagan? See, the translators of the King James Bible were so intelligent. They were, they were incredible scholars. These men were just very, very bright men. So they would have looked and they would have said, okay, it can't be Passover because it's after the days of unleavened bread. Passover comes before the days of unleavened bread in the Jewish feast day there. Secondly, Herod is not a Jew. Why would he seek to follow Jewish holidays? No, he's intending after his holiday, Easter. And Easter was around in the first century, by the way. It's an it's a ancient Babylonian pagan ceremony. As, uh, the, the worship of Ishtar and all this other stuff, Astarte, there was different names and things. The Queen of Heaven, essentially. It's a pagan fertility ceremony, if you want to get right down to it. But the translators of the King James Bible, they looked at context there. Not just the word Pascha, which could be Easter or Passover. They looked at the context and they said, this can't be Passover. That'd be a bad translation. So we have to take this word, which normally we would say is Passover, but in context, it has to be Easter. Herod is a pagan and it comes after the days of unleavened bread. So we have to stick with what the true text would be saying here. So don't fall for this lie against the King James Bible that Easter is a mistranslation. It was a faulty translation. Nope. And these Alexandrian perverts will just keep you know, regurgitating and regurgitating and regurgitating that lie to get you to question the King James Bible. Don't listen to them. Okay? Your King James Bible is God's perfect word for the English-speaking world. But let's continue. I just wanted to kick that little movement there. But we saw the last one there in verse 5 of Chapter 12 there. Uh, the church is praying. Buildings don't pray. Um, Acts chapter 13 verse 1 is the next one. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Mana, Manain, uh, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Now, there were in the church. See, people say, oh, see, it was a building. They were in the church. Uh, no, it was talking about a group of people. All right. Um, these people are listed and mentioned that they are within the church, the group of people there, the group of believers at Antioch. Again, that doesn't prove a building. Sorry about that. Next one, Acts chapter 14, verse 23. You know, I'm just going to tell you right now, as I've said in other studies, there are no references to churches being buildings. But we're going to go through the scriptures and we're going to see uh, why this is important to the Lord, that you don't worship in these buildings. Acts chapter 14, verse 23. Is that one right? Yeah. It says here, And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So these groups, um, they would ordain elders. They would say, okay, your brother so-and-so, he's, he's a 
older man here. He knows the Bible. He's been through some things, whatever. You're going to be the elder of this church, meaning this group of people. It's a group of people. It's not a building. Again, how do you become the elder of a building? You know, it doesn't work. So very important. Um, and that's the practice that we should be getting back to. You know, it's, it's a shame that we've strayed so far now that we've left the biblical practices and we're in all this pagan stuff of a one-man pastor and things and, and you go to a building and they're saved and lost people in the building and stuff like this. Completely foreign to Scripture. It's very, very, very bad. But uh, jump down to verse 27 in the same chapter. It says, And when they were come and they had got, and when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles and there they abode long time with the disciples. Gathered the church together. What did it do? Fall apart? Some boards fall off and stuff like that and they had to go gather it back together? No, it's the people. Keep that in mind. Acts 15, verse 3 and 4 are the next two. It says here, And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren, and when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. Hmm. So again, we have the church in active communication, in active uh, contact with the disciples, with you know those that had gone out there. It's people, not a building. But let's keep moving. Acts chapter 15, verse 22 is the next one. Then pleased it the apostles and elders and the whole church. See, not just apostles and elders there, but everybody, the whole church, the people, to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. People, not a building. All right. Uh, Acts chapter 18, verse 22 is the next one. Let's see if I can maybe... Get this thing here. Yeah, that's better. Acts 18, verse 22. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went to, down to Antioch. What do you go to look at the building and say, hey, you know, no. <laughs> Talking about people again. Acts chapter 20, verse 17. Turn over there. Acts chapter 20, verse 17. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Notice again, plural elders of the church. Of the church there, the one that's gathered at Ephesus. Again, very important. You know, for a long time, I believed in the one-man pastor system with a deacon or deacons underneath him. And the one man is the guy, the man of God, and all the stuff. I fell for that. Um, I have repented of that. Uh, the fact of the matter is there's supposed to be multiple elders. Uh, that's why we read over here. Let's go here real quick. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Um, this is very important. It's a, it's a safety protection thing. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, um, verse 1 says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. All right. That's how the gospel gets propagated and taken out. Not by some one man pastor putting on his show up there and he gets his family members to run the other parts of the church. Uh, -uh. it's not supposed to be that way. The pastor, his job is to train up other men who are faithful so that they can go out and teach other men. There should be multiple elders there. Multiple men in charge. Why? So one man doesn't get too powerful. So you don't have the one-man dictatorship of a Jack Hiles or somebody like that that runs things and nobody dares to question the man of God like the Baptists love to preach and teach. I mean, the Baptists are more cultic in many ways than the Roman Catholic Church itself. All right? Some of these Baptists will worship their pastor, you know, Oh, they even just call him pastor. Like a Catholic calls a priest father. You know, they won't say Father Smith or Father Jones or something. They'll just say Father, Father, you know. 
I've seen Baptists do that with their pre their pastors. I'll go up and I'll say, "Hey, pastor, uh, are we going to go to pastor's house?" Hey, pastor, pastor, pastor. They won't call them by their other name, their you know actual name. They'll just call them by the official title. Interesting. But uh, you got to watch out for that stuff. Uh, let's see where are we at here. Acts, Acts chapter. Okay, we did 20, verse 17. 20, verse 28. Very important uh, verse of Scripture in your King James Bible. It says here, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. How do you feed a building? You don't feed the church of God. It's the people. Which he hath purchased with his own blood. This is another big argument against the whole church building setup. And that is, the average church building, because they're in their mind, they're thinking, we are here to get people saved. You know, all are welcome. Bring your friends. Bring your family. Next week's going to be a revival meeting. We're going we're gonna to bring in the revival. We're going to have a good ev evangelist here, and he's going to preach hellfire and brimstone, and he's going to bring mighty revival to the area. We're going to get people saved. Invite your lost relatives to church. And what happens is the people that are there don't get fed. I mean, how can you feed people the Word of God? How can you commit the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. How can you do that when you have a limited time frame, 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock on a Sunday? Oh, well, we have a Bible Institute night too, you know, and stuff like that. Uh -huh. Sure, yeah, yeah, no. It doesn't work that way. The whole modern church setup is just absurd. Romans chapter 16, verse 1. We'll continue here. Romans 16, verse 1. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, was at, which is at Centria. Centria. Serving the church there. And again, you say, well, it's the church at Centria. Uh, well, yes, it's the group of people that are there not a building. Jump down to verse 5 of the same chapter. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Hmm. Salute my well-beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Interesting. A church in somebody's house? Sure. Romans 16, verse 23. Gaius, mine host, and of the whole church saluteth you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, saluteth you, and Cortus, a brother. All right? And if you look at the little uh, note thing there at the bottom, it says, written to the Romans from Corinthus and sent by Phoebe, servant of the church at Sencrea. Okay, that's actually listed in this concordance. I wouldn't have listed that one, but, you know, it's there. But, um, again, it's the people. It's the groups of people, not some building, not some dead building. Dead buildings can't do anything. That's why you have to continually have revivals, you know, reviving dead buildings. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2 is the next one. Under the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours church which of God which is at Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints uh, that doesn't sound like a building to me it sounds like people again probably because it is people not a building but there's another one that's interesting here first Corinthians chapter 1 jump down to verse 10 now I beseech you brethren by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that ye all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. How is that possible when you have saved and lost congregating at a church building? Hmm? And even among the uh, professing saved people, uh, are they all in the same mind and the same judgment? And you say, they'll say, what about a house church? I know house churches that have contention and stuff. Well, here's something that I haven't made very clear, and I need to clear this thing up. It's not... House church fellowships versus church building fellowships. That's not the real issue here. Because I understand you can take 
that church building thing and you can minimize it and put it into somebody's house somewhere and do the same kind of junk, have the same problems. That's not what we're talking about here. True Christian church membership is understanding that you are always in the body of Jesus Christ, in His church. All right? Meeting with groups of other Christians, that's the church of Jesus Christ of Corinth meeting with the one in Ephesus. All right? It's groups of Christians meeting together. But that doesn't mean when they depart and they go back their ways, it doesn't mean now that they're not in church anymore. You understand this? All right? It's not that you can do have a pulpit and Sunday best and singing hymns and, and gathering offering plates and all the little things that you do in your church building. You can do that in a, in a home or you can do it in a building called a church. Th that's not the issue here. What I'm advocating is that per people have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ where they realize I am in the body of Christ. I am in church all the time. There's never time off. All right. When you have this mindset that the church is some building someplace, then it creates duality in your life. Why? Well, I probably shouldn't tell you this joke, but it's really kind of funny. I wouldn't tell this in church, but you see? Oh, and, and I've seen that many, many, many times. You can deny it and say, that doesn't happen in my church. <laughs> please. Oh, please. You know, it creates a dual life. I put on my suit and tie and I walk into my holy temple and I'm a changed person. Oh, God bless you, brother. Oh, it's so fine to see you here, sister. Oh, it's so nice. Hi. Oh, it's good to see you again. Oh, I've missed seeing you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you walk outside, you're a different person. How many people go outside of the holy temple and they're out there, you know, blowing the smoke out there, puff the magic dragon, you know. Oh, man, it's about time for the service to start. Stomp on that cigarette, you know, go on in there. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. You know. See? Sitting there in the church building and you're going, nodding your head to the sermon, you're going, yeah, I hope he's done soon. I got some, we're going to have the uh, Joneses over. Going to have the Joneses over for, uh, you know, as Jones is sitting over there in that part of the congregation. I'm pretending. And, uh, you know, and see, I'm smiling. People always go, you don't ha you're not happy. You're not smiling. You don't have any joy. <laughs> okay. You don't understand true Christian joy. Okay. We rejoice in the truth. Charity rejoiceth in the truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But that's over the head of some of these wicked uh, idolaters and uh, lost scoundrels as well. Don't want to leave them out. But, um, you know, you're looking at your watch and you're going, the Joneses are coming over for, for lunch, you know, Sunday dinner, you know, and then, and then we're going to play games and we're going to go out on the bass boat, you know, in the afternoon and things like that. Make sure we're back in the church, you know, when the doors are open for the Sunday evening service, you know, we've got to do that. But we'll have our time of fellowship in the afternoon or something, you see. So you're looking at your watch and you're going, I hope this thing's over soon. Again, how's the pastor going to get doctrine? How's he going to be teaching you? Oh, that's what our Bible universities are for. Again, no scripture, but we'll just go along with that. Send people to seminary. We'll send our young people to seminary so that they enter life with huge debt. Where'd you get that from again? Was it the Bible or the world? You can't all speak the same thing if you have a church building that's open to the public where it's congregating both saved and lost. You can't all be in the same mind. Keep your finger there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, but uh, go over to Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. It says here, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. How many conversations in these church buildings are as it uh, becometh the gospel of Christ? And whether... Uh, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. How? How do you do that? Save and lost people coming together. You can't. Jump down to chapter 2 there in Philippians. Chapter 2, verse 2 says, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded 
having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. How about the next one? Verse 3, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Nothing is ever done in Baptist churches that through strife or vain glory. Jerk Kyle's coming out, you know, they're playing the music and, you know, and he comes out and they, oh, ah, people screaming and stuff like this. And he goes like this. How many Catholic preachers have I seen doing the same thing? See, I'll pick on the Catholics a lot because they're using the King James Bible. The other ones abandoned the King James Bible for, you know, a long time ago. But the, the, a lot of these independent fundamental Baptist cult buildings, they'll still use the King James Bible. And yet they disobey it regularly and then claim that they don't. It's really a problem. But let's go on to the next one. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. First Corinthians 4.17 says, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Every group of people, in other words, is what it's talking about. Again, you know, how far we've gotten away from first century practices. I mean, people, I, I get this thing all the time. I mean, I'd be, if I had a, you know, they say if, if I had a dollar, you know, um, for every time somebody asked me this question, I'd have a lot of dollars. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they say, uh, Brother Brian, do you know of any house churches in my area? I'd really like to fellowship with people. What do I do? Well, you know, if we were doing things the first century way and the body of Christ could get organized and actually say, okay, let's do things the Bible way, Let's actually organize here, and instead of sending around the Baptist evangelists and their big, huge motorhomes to go and preach the same sermons that they've been preaching for the last 20 years, instead of doing that, let's actually get these men trained by the church, by the saved people, not some Bible university or some big, stinking building that's mortgaged to the bank. Let's actually get these men trained, and we're going to go send them out and confirm churches. So somebody writes me a letter, and they say, Hey, brother, is there a church in my area? Well, let me, let me uh, pass this on to the brethren, and we'll send brother so-and-so over there. And he'll confirm a church in that area. He'll go and he'll preach on the streets and stuff like this. He'll find, you know, I get women and they'll write and they'll say, I can't, I'd like to be in a house church, but I can't start one myself because I can't preach to men. Okay, what do we need? We need some good brother, brethren to be sent out to that area and say, okay, we'll confirm, you know, we can't do one in your area exactly, but can you drive a half hour to your north or whatever else there? Because we got one started there. We'll send some people down to talk to you, you know. And how much stronger we would be as the body of Christ if there was actually that accountability there. See, you know, oh, you're afraid of going to a church building and stuff like this. Yes, because they're cultic. Right? You get into the little in crowd there with the pastor or something, things like this. Uh, and if you're not in the in crowd, well, then, you know, oh, well, you, you're going to have to go elsewhere. And then, and then they elsewhere, and then they shun you and stuff like this. But wouldn't it be better if we actually had Christians that were being sent out and growing that way and going out and confirming the churches? So you go out and you say, wait a second, I just heard about this uh, church getting started over here in Hammond. Indiana, some guy named Jack Hiles, and you send some faithful brethren over there to talk to the guy, some elders, and they go and they talk to the guy, and they go, the guy isn't even preaching the gospel. What's worse than that? We had one of his church members come up to us and say that Jack Hiles is cheating on with this guy's wife, his deacon's wife. No, we don't recommend Jack Hiles. And you go on and you, you can confirm the other churches. Think how strong the body of Christ would be. Oh, but that's okay because we have our church buildings and uh, we have sister churches of the church buildings that we recommend, but other Baptists we don't recommend and other, you know, this and that and stuff. What a, what a rotten, stinking mess. What a shame. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4 is the next one. Here's another good one that the modern churches follow for sure. 
If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. Did you ever see that happen? No. You know who judges matters in the uh, church buildings today? The ones that uh, tithe the most. They pull the uh, punches. They call the shots. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You don't set those who are less, least esteemed to judge matters in the church buildings out there. You know, you don't question the man of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32 is the next one. It says here, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. How do you offend a building? <laughs> you don't offend buildings, brethren. You offend people. Interesting. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18. It says, For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Now see, here's one, and they'll use ones like this, and they'll use some other ones. They say, see, now look, it's the people. When ye come together, there's the people, in the church, there's the building. Uh, no, because you see, the people are always referred to as the church. But, you're separate from other believers, but you're still in the church. But when you come together, the church is there. Does it cease becoming the church because smaller churches, people that are in the church, have come together with other people that are in the church? It now ceases to become the church? No, of course not. It's saying, when ye come together in the church, it doesn't mean that they're meeting in a building. It's just simply saying, hey, yes, so you're in the church, but when all of you come together, you're still in that church. And we're going to see this later on about the house of God. I can you know, further confirm the point. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22. What, have ye not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. All right. Now, again, we're seeing a thing here. Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? They have their own private homes, but what are they doing? When they're meeting together as the church, all coming together, people are bringing their own food and things like this, and one guy's hungry, another one's, you know, drunken and things like this, and they're going, you know, you know, what are you doing here? I mean, you're, you're, you have your own houses to eat and drink in. When you come together to meet as Christians, don't be bringing in all this stuff and all this, these other things. That's all it's saying there. It's not saying, you know, come together in some building called a church. You know, it's crazy. But these are the kind of scriptures that they'll try to use, church building people will try to use to shame you that you're not in a church anymore, so you're not right with God. Uh, quite the contrary. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28 is the next one. It says here, And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, Notice it says gifts of healings, plural. This is not the sign gift of laying on of hands and the sick recovering. All right, miraculous healing. I did a study on this. It is plural, gifts of healings. There's a lot of different ways that you can heal people. All right, be they nutritional therapy, prayer, fasting, you know, things like that. There's a lot of different ways, exercise, diet, nutrition. You know, there are gifts of healings. Helps governments, diversities of tongues. But you see there, God has set some in the church. People. I'm not talking about infrastructure there in the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. How do you edify a building? You don't. It's the people. Again, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5. I would rather I would that ye all speak with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. Again, like I said in the previous verse, you're edifying the people, not a building. Jump down to verse 12 of the same chapter. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. You see this over and over again in this chapter. Look at verse 19. 
Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also, than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue. Again, a reference to when the people come together. That is the church. All right? And again, you know, and, and, and you know, the people that meet in the buildings, these Babel buildings, they'll say, yes, we understand that. You know, we understand that. Eh. No, you don't. No, you don't. Because you keep, you are forcing yourself into this continued lying hypocrisy of calling a building a church. I mean, think of it this way. What would happen if a tornado came through and knocked down your church building? You'd say, uh, well, we couldn't go to church this week, so we met in so-and-so's house. Wouldn't you? And you can claim, oh, you wouldn't say it was it, because I'm confronting you. But you know, good and well, that if I wasn't bringing up this as a point, you would say, we couldn't go to church this week because it was ruined by a tornado. So we had to meet someplace else. You see? That's why when you're reading in your New Testament, it's when the church comes together, when the church comes together, it can come together all over the place. But I can guarantee you, if you went back in time to the first century and you said, that Greek Parthenon over there, how about we have a church service there? They'd have looked at you like you were crazy. They'd have said, what? <laughs> we're not going to meet in that place. Are you kidding me? That's a pagan temple. I'm not going over there. Meeting in that place? No way. We're not going to assemble the church inside that pagan temple. Interesting. I mean, if, if you saw my study on the independent fundamental Baptist Catholicism, I talk about some of that and some of the early Christians, or I shouldn't say early, but some of the uh, Anabaptists back in the 1500s, uh, they, I think it was the 1500s, I'd, I don't remember the story exactly, the exact details, but there was a time when they were given the opportunity, they were jailed, might have even been in the 1700s, I forget, 1600s or 1700s, sorry, I'm forgetting the story, but they were jailed for having an unlawful meeting, you know, that was not sanctioned by a church building. Uh, very interesting because Putin, Vladimir Putin there in Russia, actually just said no witnessing outside of church buildings. Just passed it here just not long ago. No witnessing outside of church buildings, only within the church building. I mean, look it up. It's, it's crazy. But these guys were told that hundreds of years ago, and they were given the option. They said, either you can go attend a church service, or we will publicly flog you, publicly whip you. And these men back then, these early these Christians back a couple hundred years ago, they said, we'll take the beating. We're not walking into those pagan buildings. I show the documentation on it in my study. You can check it out. Just crazy. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 23. Let's go to the next one. Here's another one that's used by the Babel Buildingites. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? All right. So they say, see, here's a reference to lost people coming into the church. Oh, well, I'd like to make a couple points there. First of all, it says, if therefore... Not when, right? It's a condition, right? But let's, let's look at the rest of the verse here. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and some unbeliever walks in among them. Well, now think about that. You get a bunch of Christians getting together in a public place as they would have done back there in the first century. They met in Solomon's porch a lot in the book of Acts it, outside the Jewish temple there. They're meeting outside there and there's all these people coming and everything else. Of course there's unbelievers going to come in there and stuff like that. I mean, you go out to some fair or some big thing in carnival or whatever else and you meet with a bunch of other brethren to, to pass out tracts and you get to talking about it and things and you start praying and you everybody's got their Bibles and, and stuff. It will draw a crowd. I'll tell you that. You go out street preaching in some big public place and whatever else. Start to, to preach the Word of God. It will draw a crowd. Of course there's going to be unbelievers coming in. And what Paul is rebuking in this passage is that you come together and everybody starts speaking different languages. That's what tongues means. Okay, again, I have a study on that. You can watch that. But everybody's speaking different languages. The unbelievers are going to go, these people are crazy, you know. Rightfully so. 